couple of weeks ago, I was in Washington DC and I participated in the Brookings Institute on a debate on the US-China uh, relationships and uh, it was televised at the time and I remember thinking, oh, I have not seen something similar, a similar initiative in Brussels. Um, but that was uh, a couple of weeks before I got uh, Gabriel's invitation. And I was very happy to see that uh, in Brussels also we have initiatives on the new protectionism. So I want to congratulate uh, Gabriel and Clemens for organizing this conference because I think the debate, if anything, now is, is, is very useful and very, um, and very relevant, very timely. Um, I am an academic, so I'm not here to comment on any policy things that are going on. Uh, as an academic, I think it is my role, especially in this conference, to provide you with numbers. I think it's for policy people to make the decisions, and I think academics and, and other um, institutions in the policy area, the best they can do is to provide the information that they think is as relevant as possible for policymakers perhaps to, pay, to make better decisions. So at some point, I decided to focus on um, TTIP. TTIP, for those of you who may not know, I'm sure everybody knows, but was um, a free trade agreement that was being negotiated between the Obama administration and the EU, uh, and that was already in, you know, far advanced. Uh, but as soon as Mr. Trump became president, the f one of the first things he did was sort of to dismiss with the TTIP agreement, and that meant that at least for some time to come, we're not going to have a free trade agreement with the US, and listening to the panel this morning, it seems as if that's not going to be that easily reversed. Why did the TTIP no longer uh, was, was it no longer on the table when Mr. Trump arrived? Well, I think there are a number of potential reasons for that. People say maybe the agreement that was being negotiated was too wide in scope. It did not only cover trade, it covered also things like public procurement, even uh, in sectors like health. The only sector that was dismissed was the cultural sector. So it wasn't a great success, but um, the question that can be raised, and this is also some kind of new protectionism, is not just about tariffs being imposed, it's about not having certain agreements executed that were on the table before. And so one of the things you can do as an academic or, a, or as somebody interested in policy issues is you can actually calculate how much that is going to cost us and the US in terms of value added or in terms of jobs that we're now not going to have as a result of TTP not going through. So that's basically what we try to do in this paper. So first of all, we documented what are the actual barriers between the EU and the US at this point in time. Well, there are tariff barriers, which you may think are very low, and on average they are very low, they're about 3%. But if you look at various sectors, you see that, for some sectors at least, barriers are still relatively high between the EU and the US. And these are MFN tariffs, most favored nation tariffs, as they are agreed upon in the, uh, in the WTO. So you see um, you know, sectors like textiles and food and motor vehicles, you know, tariffs are still quite substantial. Not just tariffs, but also non-tariff barriers exist between the two blocks. For example, and some people already alluded to it in the panel this morning, the US tests car safety in a very different way than the EU. They do it without a safe belt, and in the EU, car safety is measured with a safe belt. This is typically what we call a different standard, a different product standard. And to try and harmonize that, well, as we heard uh, somebody from the trade department say this morning, when things are set in stone, it's sometimes uh, difficult to, to change people's ways and thinking about this. Is there room for a uniform test? Well, uh, that was one of the difficulties people were facing in the negotiations. Another example, the US has electric wires in yellow and green, but the EU has electric wires in black and white. So can this be uniformized? All things that we categorize as non-tariff barriers. And there are multiple examples. Uh, also in pharmaceuticals, for example, in suntan oil, which in the US are tested like a medical drug, uh, and are subject to medical tests. In the EU, that's not the case. Uh, this is not likely to change. So the US also, for example, requests a different position for car bumpers than the rest of the world. 
so that a, a company like Toyota has to put special bumpers on car exports to the US. So you see this fragments the markets. And therefore, you can understand why big trade blocs like the US and the EU have an interest in trying to uniform these things. Because for business, it's going to be much easier if you can overcome some of these non-trade barriers. So what are we missing? OK, I can go on. Maybe time is too short to discuss all the examples, but just to flag that you know the non-tariff barriers also relate to things like environmental issues. The chickens were mentioned before. On health issues, you know, we have some problems with genetically modified food, uh, genetically manipulated food. Um, legal issues. Uh, remember, in the CETA agreement, the difficulty. Uh, in the European Parliament uh, about the investor state dispute settlement. The list is long, okay? So just to convince you, there are a lot of tariff barriers still in place between the US and the EU, but first and foremost, there are a number of non-tariff barriers which are perhaps even more difficult to overcome. Now, the question can be raised, is there, you know, what is the academic view, or are there academic models that would give some predictions about the effects of TTIP? In other words, if this free trade agreement would be in place between the e EU and the US, sorry, um, what do these models predict for firms, for consumers, for workers, for exports, for market structure? And is there any empirical evidence to support these predictions? What can we learn from them? Well, there is a substantial chunk of literature. Let me refer to the literature on firm dynamics, whereby we know from a paper by Melitz Otaviano and other people that when you have a free trade agreement, typically what happens between firms is two types of effects. You have reallocation effects and you have selection effects. What do selection mean? Well, it means that some firms will go out of business. Which firms? Well, the predictions of the academic world is especially the small firms and the least productive firms. They're most likely to suffer, and these could very well be domestic firms. What about reallocation effects? Well, the models tell you that the surviving firms will get bigger, since the market share of the small firms that exit the market will be taken over by these larger firms. So we'll have some increase in inequality in terms of firm size, in terms of market power also. So the inequality between firms will increase. However, consumers could potentially gain because we will have access to cheaper products. Typically, higher productive firms and larger firms tend to put their products on the markets at cheaper prices. Workers could gain because in more productive firms, you can actually earn a higher wage. But as a worker in a small firm, you may actually be displaced. Okay? The market power of large firms will be going up due to the larger scale at which they operate, and market concentration is likely to go up. Now, these studies were studies on firm dynamics, and one of the things they do is they assume that there is some long-run instant adjustment also in the labor market, uh, and they do not consider also some kind of input-output linkages between sectors. And this is uh, where I sort of come in with a study that we did recently, where basically we're trying to get at what would be job losses from not having TTIP if you take into account that when you integrate a bloc like the US and the EU, you should not just look at the direct trade flows between them, but you should also be aware that, for example, production is fragmented. Fragmented means you have global value chains. And when you think about global value chains, you should look at trade policy questions differently. And that's basically what we argued in the TTIP paper. We have a similar paper on Brexit. We are sort of trying to stress this point that, let me give you an example to make that clear. If you want to assess how good, say, a trade agreement as TTIP would be for Belgian steel exporters, well, typically you will find that if the tariffs would be going down on the US side, that Belgian steel would be exported more intensively to the US. 
That's one effect. But maybe the effect that you're forgetting next is the fact that this Belgian steel is also heavily used as an intermediate in German cars. German cars would also get lower tariffs in the case of a TTIP. So in fact, you have a direct effect on the Belgian steel sector, but on top of that, you have maybe an even bigger indirect effect. Because Belgium's not just supplying intermediates to the German car sector, it's also feeding inputs to the French uh, airplane sector, for example, or in construction in Spain. So there's a lot of sectors that sort of indirectly ship this Belgian steel to the US. And if you want to take that into account in your calculations, which is what we try to do in this paper, you need to look at input-output tables. So for this purpose, we used the world input-output data uh, because we wanted to not just to look at direct trade to the US. We also wanted to document how big is the indirect trade via third countries. Um, so the data are world trade uh, input-output data. Uh, one of the things you can do with this data is kind of look at what sector is going to be central in the network of production. I mentioned steel earlier. As you can imagine, steel, but also chemicals, for example, is a very central sector in the European network. In other words, if you want to capture how much are jobs affected in Belgian steel, you have to take into account that, well, this steel sector is not just supplying all other sectors maybe in Europe, but it's also a very central sector in the network economy. And if it's a very central sector, then these effects are going to be even larger than for a sector which may also be supplying intermediates, but is not so central in the network. So that's what we try to take into account uh, in this study. Um, in case you wonder, this uh, data set has 43 countries um, plus the rest of the world, and it has 56 sectors. So basically what we are saying, and this is another important point I want to stress, if you want to look at the trade relationships US-EU, uh, you should not just look at EU-US, you should look at the entire world. Because maybe your Belgian steel is first going to Mexico before it enters the US, right? So how can you really study a free trade agreement by just focusing on these two countries? If you're going to take into account all the indirect effects, it really means you need a, a model that can deal with the entire world at sector level, and two, you need a data set that covers the entire world. And that's basically the two objectives that we try to achieve in this paper. So we came up with a model that had all the input-output structures in place, and the first thing we did is to document what we call interconnectivity. So for every European country, what you see here on the graph is the interconnectivity with the US economy. What you see as numbers are really employment that is uh, depending on work or trade with the US. So for example, let me take an example of the Belgian economy, for example, the number 155 suggests that there's 150,000 people working in Belgium that are directly or indirectly affected with trade with the US. It doesn't mean that's the number of jobs that are at risk by not having a free trade agreement. It just means if you're interested in the interconnectivity, so for Germany, for example, that number is over 1 million. Over 1.2 million, 1 million jobs that depend on trade directly or indirectly with the US, okay? Now, of course, Germany is a much bigger country than Belgium, so you should say, well, maybe you should look at this proportionally proportion to the working age population. And that's what these dots are. So these red dots kind of give you what country is most connected to the US economy when you look at it in absolute numbers of jobs or when you look at it proportionately. The answer is somewhat different. If you look at it in absolute numbers, definitely it's the German economy. If you look at it in proportionate numbers, it's going to be Ireland, uh, followed by the Netherlands, followed by Belgium, for example, okay? So this measure of interconnectivity already tells you what may happen or may not happen when you have a free trade agreement with the US, yes or no. Okay, what we did in this paper, we just looked at two scenarios. We have what we call a shallow scenario and we have a deep scenario. And the shallow scenario just means, okay, what if we got rid of all the tariffs, but we keep sort of the current level of non-tariff barriers, which are not minor, and the deep integration would be you have no tariffs and you reduce maximally the non-tariff barriers. 
Let me give you the results. First, show it to you by country. So this is basically aggregating all the country sector effects. Because in the data, we have an effect for every country sector in Europe. But somehow, to put that in a table is impossible, so we aggregate by country. Okay, so you see, indeed, some of the countries that are most affected are Belgium, the Netherlands, and Germany in terms of absolute job numbers in the shallow and deep uh, effect, with the totals at the bottom, because I have to speed up. So in the shallow scenario, this would be 233,000 EU jobs that would either be having or not having, depending on whether we have TTIP. So you could say that's the cost of having not having TTIP, because these are jobs that currently are not being created. And that could go up to one million in the case we could get rid of an important chunk of these non-tariff barriers. Uh, for the US, these numbers are not quite comparable. As you will see, the gains are lower. The gains are lower, so one of the uh, important conclusions we arrived at in this study is that the European economy seems much more integrated production-wise than the US one. Okay, so to summarize, um, the gains in the EU in terms of GDP would lie between 0.26 and 1.3%. For the US, these numbers would lie between 0.11 and 0.79%. Um, so jobs I already mentioned, um, meaning that if you are interested in the short-run dynamics or the short-run effects, <coughs> which is the only thing our study is saying anything on, because this is not the full TTIP effects, this is just the trade effects, leaving aside everything related to investment, <coughs> procurement, of all these issues that would have made the TTIP very difficult to conclude, but just focusing on the trade effects. If I can conclude, an FTA between the EU and the US seems to be like a win-win in the short run for both countries. It would have generated jobs and GDP growth. It would also generate firm dynamics, mainly in favor of large firms, potentially rising markets and displacement of workers towards more productive sectors. And it also would seem that the EU has more to gain than the US when taking into account input-output linkages. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Hilke. And sorry to rush everyone, we have two minutes for two questions, so please. <coughs> yes, Mr. Welfitz. Yeah, I'm Paul Welfitz from the European Institute. Um, I was uh, quite impressed by this presentation. On the other hand, uh, there's this question about the role of uh, foreign direct investment and um, the R&D effects. So uh, did you take also a particular look at uh, the technology intensity? Because that is maybe different when you have goods where you have um, these technology effects. And I think part of the international technology transfer in any case is linked to FDI. Thank you. If there's a second question, I would like to take it immediately. So, if not. Okay, the uh, FDI effects, I think, could be uh, a complement to this study. Because, as we know, often FDI follows trade. So, if trade is rising, typically that could be uh, complemented with increase investment patterns both ways. The short answer to your question is no. In this study, we did not take that investment response into account because we focused on the short run. So we just said, okay, we have to confine our study somewhere. Let's just focus on tariffs and non-tariff barriers. But you are very right. I mean, it would be interesting to have a study that would show how much additional investment are we missing as a result of not having TTIP. And with investment, as you rightly pointed out, comes you know, productivity growth, comes innovation. And so that is, I, I think, also part of what we are missing. So it really would mean that potentially the losses or the facts that what we're not having today is larger than what we have been telling in our study. Because if you complement it with studies on FDI innovation and firm growth, then typically you would find that the effects are likely to be bigger in the longer run. This is just a short run. Uh, yeah, one question. So is it possible in your model to identify loser regions or sectors or 
That's a Other very good any? question. Sectors, yes. So the sectors in the wired data are NACE two digit. So basically we have all the results for country NACE two digit, whether that is goods or services. Because for services, what we have to keep in mind is, okay, there's no tariffs on services, as we all know, but we know that in manufacturing, there's a lot of services embedded. So if tariffs are going down and we can trade more goods, as a result, the demand for services will also rise. So we did take that into account. Uh, whether we can do results at the region level, um, I think we can, as soon as you have a correspondence between where is a sector located in a country or a region, and there are firm level data sets that you could use for that to kind of indicate to you, for example, where are the Belgian steel producers in Belgium, where are the car manufacturers in Germany, and then you could almost, once you have the predictions for country sector, you could indicate where the regions are, are where are the regions that are being affected. Um, unfortunately, as I was saying uh, to Gabriel earlier, uh, from an academic point of view, exercises like this are difficult to publish. We know why this is, but I can share it with you. This is very interesting from a policy point of view, but at the university we just don't have always the incentives to go deeper. So we try to scratch the surface and then we sort of see what the interest is. If the interest is not very big, then we think, okay, we move on to something else. But I agree with you. I mean, one of the things that was definitely on our agenda, but it got cluttered in other academic projects is, okay, if we can go at country sector, can we actually visualize? Because that would be nice to have a map of Europe and then to sort of visualize in colors where the strong employment effects would be, like the Otter, Dorn, and Hansen paper, for example, with the Chinese import competition that some people say actually influenced the outcome of the U.S. election. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Hilke. Uh, we now have to move on. Uh, Stefano, please. And uh, you know, some... Well, when Stefano puts up his stuff, some people do have time to do studies like this, and there has been in the TTIP discussion one yeah. that does exactly that type of exercise, breaks it down to the regional level. Uh, and, and comes up with a, with a funny colored map. Uh, I think Joe and the AmpCham, the American Chamber of Commerce, Joe Franco, is, they, they, they did this thing. But uh, they didn't publish it. No, not, not in the journal. Okay. 